All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Toronto in Canada by Matthias Ochinski. How are you doing, Matthias? Good, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Matthias is the founder and CEO of um, Belongnomics and uh, an empirical economist with extensive experience in applied research and statistical analysis, uh, a senior le uh, lecturer at the University of Toronto's Monk School for Global Affairs and Public Policy. You also teach at undergrad and grad level. And what we wanted to talk today about is the future of work, inclusive growth and, and changing skills demand. And here is one of the interesting things, Matthias, is um, my son and a lot of his friends like graduate in high school now and they're talking about colleges and jobs. And, and the reality is that there's a, a lot of the jobs in in the near future even haven't haven't really even been invented yet or people even haven't even thought of them or haven't considered them yet be and, and we're still kind of stuck in kind of very traditional modes if you like what what are you what's your thoughts on that yeah that's certainly true uh, and especially the pandemic uh, has accelerated a lot of that as well so what we find in the data is that um what the pandemic has kind of fostered more is uh adoption of digital technologies, adoption of automation um, because of, you know, remote work and uh, physical distancing. And um, that will actually kind of accelerate the, the, the change in skill requirements uh, that have already that has already been going on in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. Um, and that's why I think when we when it comes to education, especially when we talk about high school education, um, uh, I think a lot of the um, the focus needs to be on um, instilling in people the willingness to keep learning. So a lot of my students, you know, always tell me, uh, "Thank God I'm I'm out of here and I have to I don't have to learn anything anymore." Uh, and I think that's kind of a really wrong attitude for the future of work because what will happen in the, in you know for for most of us in our lifetimes and especially for for the younger people is um, we will see much more. Uh, the requirement uh, for continuous learning, uh, lifelong learning, the career changes throughout uh, somebody's life. Uh, and that just requires, um, I think, a different attitude to learning and also teaching a different skill set in high school and maybe even in undergrad. Uh, so it's not about uh, giving you the skills to then join the job market and stay there for the next 30, 40 years or so, but uh, more around uh, what are the skills that help you to acquire new skills uh, you know going forward yeah i know i i would agree and i, and I think there's a there's an interesting phenomenon as well i'm mean, gonna even see this with my with my son is i when he takes an interest would interest in something and you say oh well maybe you want to do that in college or maybe you want to take a course in that or whatever and he'll say well no i prefer to learn it independently uh, and they go a lot to you know to youtube to the people who they respect and so and i think I think and to and I think to your point about you know lifelong learning is we're not really encouraging that or identifying that um and helping people realize that that um you know lifelong learning is, is that important but I think the willingness is there if we if we present it in the correct way Yes uh, I I completely agree I think also I I like what you just said about also you know the um like alluding to trying things out when you're younger there's a really good book by i think uh, david epstein uh it's called range and uh, it, it it kind of looks into what makes people successful uh you know as they get older and what he finds is a lot of people in their younger years uh when they dabble in different things and try different things out um uh, they actually become more successful because it everything adds to your experience and you you kind of get a better sense of how things hang together and so on and I think that that kind of is, is the reverse of what we've been doing, you know, in the last 40 or 50 years where we try to narrow things down very early on, where you have to make a decision in really young years, what you want to be, who, you, who where do you want to go? Um, and I think what we need to do is the opposite to say, you know, just, you know, try a couple of different things, uh, try things out, try different sectors, maybe different uh, um, kind of uh, jobs. 
and uh, and that really adds to also your resilience uh, when things change in the market, which which will happen, uh, you know, going forward uh, quite more frequently. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think then we have, uh, and as you said, I mean, I think we have an obligation to encourage this because, you know, let, let's face it. I mean, we're, we're getting people today to make, as you said, to make decisions. Fine. If you want to be a lawyer, that's great. You know, it's pretty, it's a pretty straightforward path, but for everybody else who doesn't have that, that in place, we're kind of shoehorning them into, oh, go here, do this four year degree and, or go here, do this four year degree or go, go to this, um, this college or that college. And really, we're we're not we're not equipping them i think with the the ability to do what you just said is to be flexible is to experiment is to try different things you know we're always trying to box people in and i just and and if anything if if the pandemic and technology advances have taught us anything it's that the the boxes can fall apart very quickly yeah that's correct and i think um uh, what what my work is a lot of concerned with is also how do we help those uh, mm -hmm. you know to, who are most vulnerable uh, to to create um, more resilience for them and what we also find is uh, what um, you know the pandemic it, it it's in all the data and it, it was actually across all the OECD countries uh, it uh, really mainly affected um, visible minorities uh, women immigrants uh, and. Uh, so there's a lot of more vulnerable groups that were, have been affected uh, really negatively by by this, and, and many of them will also be more negatively affected by uh, this the transformation, the, the digital transformation that's going on. And I think what we need to equip them with is uh, to, and this is a lot of what the work that I'm trying to do is, um, how can you make better decisions in given this uncertainty uh, that we have around, you know, where are things headed? Where is the future of work? What are the future skills, uh, skill requirements? And I think we need, uh, what, what all the data shows is we need better information and we also need uh, better tools uh, for, to develop tools for these people uh, to enable them to make better decisions. And I think uh, that's, that's something that's where um, a lot more work needs to be done. Actually. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree on that because I mean, as you said at the outset, is like you know we're we're trying to make force people to make decisions you know very early, and I think one of the things you just touched on there is um, the anxiety, and particularly maybe if you're part of one of the marginalized groups you talk about is there's a great deal of anxiety about what to do next, what how where do I put my next foot forward, and and we're not really helping we're not helping assuage any of this anxiety because we're not really changing anything. We're not helping, you know, we're not informing people better. We're not, so we're saying, as you said, automation, digital transformation, it's all great. You know, we're, we're a part of that, but we're not explaining how it actually helps individuals who may think that this is just, it's going to just replace them. They're going to be marginalized. You know, how, how can you, how can you equip yourself with the skills that will be relevant going forward? I mean, none of this is really being tackled right now. Yeah, that's a that's a really really good point, uh, and this is why I always say, you know, we need uh, inclusive innovation. Uh, so, you know, what, when when we ultimately think about uh, what's the purpose of innovation, it's not about having a ton of new toys uh, that we can mm -hmm. play with. Um, innovation is necessary for, you know, going forward, we need to spur more growth and it can only come from innovation and we also need to tackle uh, climate change and for that we need uh, a lot more innovation as well. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's exactly the point that you made uh, is to explain to people uh, how we intend uh, to take them with us. Uh, so, you know, people like me and you uh, will probably mm -hmm. not have uh, too many issues uh, with these changes. Uh, but uh, when we mm -hmm. look at back, I mean, it, it happened once before already uh, when um, we had the wave of globalization. And, you know, yeah. I'm an economist, so I believe in free trade, uh, free market. Uh, and uh, but people were people were always told globalization is good for us. It will just, you know, generate more wealth and more opportunities. But there were a lot of people who were left behind uh, because we didn't put the right mechanisms in place to say, so where can you go now when your job's being outsourced? And uh, a similar thing is now happening with, uh, you know, this digital transformation where we say um, this will be great because it will increase uh, uh, productivity, growth potentials. Uh, but the, the question we need to ask is, so how can we take people with us 
uh, who will be negatively negatively affected by this. And there's you know there there's ways we can do this in an inclusive way, and this will also help then uh, with the acceptance. You know, people there's a, there has been a backlash against globalization because uh, a lot of people were mm -hmm. marginalized by that, and. I think to avoid a backlash against innovation, uh, we need to make it more inclusive from the outset and say, okay, let's have everybody, let, let, let's do everything we can to, to help everybody be, uh, you know, benefiting from this. Yeah, no, I, those, I, I totally agree. And those are, those are great points. And it always makes me recall um, that documentary, I think the one Michael Moore did the first one, like Roger and me, but when the people in Detroit, uh, one of the factories that was closing and the jobs were being moved over to Flint, Michigan, and they were cheering, the workers were cheering when the last car came off the, um, the assembly line and everybody was you know, everybody was all upbeat, not realizing what that actually meant. And, you know, fast forward, like Flint then turned into a, you know, a wasteland. So to your point, I think, yeah, we made massive mistakes with globalization in terms of, you know, just destroying communities without putting anything in or equipping them for, for a different future. And we run the risk of doing the same thing with, as you said, with innovation and digital transformation. So what, what are, what are some of the ways that this can be, this can be tackled? Because for me, it, it, I mean, to most people, it looks like it's a, it's a runaway train right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, part of the work that I'm uh, involved in is, is uh, th there's a couple of things. What we need to understand a little better is, you know, what kind of skills will be required um, in to be. So when you think about automation and digitization, um, there are skills that are more complement uh, to, uh, you know, to the machine. Um, and then there are skills that the machine can take over and, uh, and mm -hmm. replace you. Uh, so and the question is, uh, you know what are those skills that are more complementary to automation, so that make uh, that enables you to work with the machine. Um, and there's kind of a, a fairly clear picture that you know more creative skills, more analytical skills, a lot of interpersonal skills that cannot be uh, digitized yet. Uh, and then the question becomes: So how do we ca how can we ensure that people learn this better? And so one one big project that I'm involved in right now for Canada is uh, to uh, to kind of estimate. What's your risk uh, of being affected negatively by automation uh, in your current occupation? And then to determine, um, uh, you know, which alternative, based on your skill sets, uh, which alternative occupations exist for you, where could you go? But then to also analyze, and, that's, and there's a couple of tools out there already that, you know, where, where people can go and say like, oh, based on my current skill set, where could I go? But, but, but what's mainly missing from this is to then say, What's the gap that I have to move from my current occupation to one that is a little safer? Um, and where can I go and retrain for this? And so, for instance, what uh, the OCD finds is um, there's a lot of there's there's a big big lack in in uh, career guidance for adults. Like there's a lot of effort, you know, at the high school level, at the university level, but we haven't really been good at. Um, because it hasn't happened so so much so far that, yeah. that work life has been so disrupted by uh, so massively um so there's a bit of a lack of uh, on on uh, you know lifelong career uh, advice and career guidance for adult workers and we just need to get better at this and so what we're trying to do now is to say uh, can we you know develop some digital tools uh, that help uh, with giving you the right information and uh, then um give you a bit of a sense of like, okay, I have the skills gap, where can I go and get the education that I need? So is, is there an online course that I can do or is there something in my community college that I can attend? And um, the effort is basically, or the, the intention is to to make this as tailored as possible to each individual. So like, you know, you're in this specific situation, you need the skill set, you can go uh, there and do this. And um, it's quite an undertaking, but uh, it's. I think it's it's going to be necessary because we need to step up the game for uh, for career path for adult workers. Actually, because that th those will be the most affected in the next ten, fifteen years or so. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating point that you that you make there. Because let's face it, when it comes to when when we become adults, I mean, some people are motivated to educate. A lot of people. Uh, to educate themselves a lot of people as you said earlier you know think okay my schooling is behind me maybe they didn't have great experience in in formal education to begin with so they're a bit switched off it so whatever we do in terms of uh, 
of engaging adults in adult education and that you know we have to we, we're going to have to create something that's um, more enticing perhaps than it is today and maybe to your point is explain why it's important because it, it, the world we all grew up in right you know you leave school you go to college if you're lucky and then you come out of college you get a job and really you're on your own right you're on your own nobody's helping you yeah. from there on in you're you're just going to help yourself and that's it yeah that's true and i think uh, i mean there's an opportunity as well here because i mean like you know um what, what one one aspect that is becoming clear to a lot of uh, um, companies out there is uh, there's going to be a hunt for global talent as it's sometimes called you know like yeah. uh, really corporations need more talented people but it also means that they need to get involved in a little bit more uh, in in helping with the education side so uh, there's some evidence that suggests that higher skilled workers who all, already earn quite a lot receive more workplace training uh, in, in compared to those who are you know lower educated and, and don't earn so much and I think this needs to be fixed uh, as well because uh, the, the problem is uh, there's a lot of un, untapped uh, potential uh, there, mm -hmm. and and I think um, what I find, you know, I grew up in Germany where it's kind of normal yeah. for the companies to train workers themselves, and when I moved to Canada, uh, there were a lot of uh, companies <laughs> that said like. <laughs> What can the government do uh, to help me find workers who can hit the ground running? And I'm like, well, that's kind of the wrong attitude for an entrepreneur. Like, it's it's part of your job as well yeah. to train to or at least help train the workforce um, uh, that you need in the future. And I mean, granted, some small and size enterprises might have a, you know, uh, have more difficulty, and you, you need to maybe then work together with local colleges. And there's definitely some some room for for government intervention, but but some effort needs to come also from uh, from uh, companies uh, because you can't just expect that um, you can get the, the, the talent pool, uh, you know, uh, prepared by the government and then you just tap into this. Some of it you kind of need to develop yourself as well. So. Yeah, and, and I think and I think um, part of the issue, certainly here in this in the States, and I'm sure it's the same in Canada, is this um, and it's funny saying to somebody who who work, who does work in higher ed too, but uh, it's like this fixation with the college degrees here. It's, I mean, you could, I mean, I always talk about this experience I had a while back when the corporate HR, the company I was, I was running one of the the, the child companies, uh, and I wanted to hire somebody. I wanted to interview somebody who had a fantastic resume, and they kept saying, "But he doesn't have a college degree." And I said, "But he's forty, and he's like got a ton of great experience." And they said, "But that's our policy." And I'm like, well, it's a super policy because I don't care what he did in college like 20 years ago. I care about what he's done since then. But I think we we have to start, as you said, um, because I think that's a great get out of jail free card for companies to say, well, we only hire, you know, well-educated, college-educated people, you know, and therefore we don't we don't need to train them because they're smart people. Yeah, that's uh... I was surprised myself when I moved here and I found this attitude that also that it was this big distinction made between you know if you have uh, if you just got yeah. uh, training uh, or or you went or you went to college that that does just doesn't exist uh, to the same degree in Germany where you know there's a high regard also for for professional training and um, in fact actually uh, you know a lot of uh, so the 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 person uh, who is the CEO of uh, Siemens Canada? Um, he once told me that uh, he started a professional training course in, in uh, at Siemens in Germany, and then you know they started educating him within the firm, sending him training uh, courses and so on. And now he he runs uh, Siemens Canada. So th this is kind of an example where I think companies can uh, definitely get more involved in uh, as a, because as I said, like there's a I, there's a lot of potential, and yeah. um, you we need to make the effort. Uh, to you know, to bring out those those skills in people and and uh, help develop them, um, and uh, I think to always yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I think here it it really bugs me to the degree that it's always outsourced, so to speak. To uh, you know, this is the this, the university should take care of this or the government should take care mm -hmm. of this. When when I think uh, the different stakeholders need to work together um, uh, to to develop this. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I totally agree. And I've always said, like, having been in the training industry myself, I mean, I've always said that if you put 100, if you gather together 100 CEOs and ask them how important training was, 100 hands would go up. 
But then if you asked them a follow-up question and said, how much budget are you allocating to training your people this year? Um, you might get two hands to go up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, this is kind of a finding. Uh, there's a, um, a fairly recent OECD uh, uh, report out on, I think they, they looked into different countries and uh, uh, what the effort is uh, that is being made in, in uh, creating career guidance for adult, uh, adult workers. And uh, they find the same thing. That it's just very little effort yet, and and workplace training is kind of skewed towards the already higher educated, uh, higher earning uh, potentials. And I think we need to just uh, broaden this because uh, also when you think about it, it's, it's you know when you think. I mean, as I as, I, as you said in your introduction, I, I love the statistics. And when you think of, when you believe in the normal distribution, it's it's it, 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 it's unbelievable to think that. Uh, you know the the higher educated are always smarter and and have um, you know they 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 have the the higher IQs or something. I think sometimes it's also when when you take the normal distribution across the population, um, there's definitely smart people everywhere, and we just need to to help them develop their potential more. And I think that's uh, that's where I think uh, some more effort is required. Actually. Yeah, and I, and I think the last thing is, uh, as you alluded to earlier, uh, is we need to we need to help people become more flexible, more nimble, uh, and expect that, and and you know, and, and expect yeah. that their career is going to be a a series probably of left turn, right turns here, you know, maybe change of, but it's not going to be this linear path that maybe once upon a time was was maybe was true once upon a time, but it's certainly not today, true today. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably the, the the role that high school can play as well now. To um, uh, you know, I think there are certain skills, or, or there's, a, there's probably a certain way to all help us better to live more with uncertainty better than than we used to, because uh, you know times will be more rocky going forward, I believe, and the period from. I mean, we always believe, or we always think of this like nine to five world that we <laughs> had until recently, as you know, as mm -hmm. as if this was set in stone, and it, it was always the case. But in the end, it's uh, it's kind of a product of the the post World War Two world. You know, like when you like I I read it, I, I did read a lot on, you know, the first industrial revolution, the second industrial mm -hmm. revolution in, in the course of my research, and when you think about the the way people worked. Uh, prior to the first industrial revolution and during the first industrial revolution it was nothing like uh, the way we organize um life and work life uh, right now and i think um th that's also the thing about uh, digital technologies it, it will not just change uh what we work with and you know how many computers we have and whatever it will really change uh, also the way we arrange uh, work and life in general and so it will disrupt yeah. everything and this will also change uh, this this nine to five uh, uh, work uh, life that we built uh, so far, and and uh, so that's why I'm thinking we need uh, yeah completely agree with you that we need to prepare people um, to embrace this uh, this this uncertainty that is coming, and it's like okay, how can I be more resilient uh, in in in, mm -hmm. in the face of this? Yeah, no, absolutely, and 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 learn and learn a new skill that's just suddenly appeared you know like i mean because there are there are skills you need today that you didn't need yesterday there'll be skills you need tomorrow that you didn't need today so that that the ability to be able to to flex and learn um listen all of uh, matthias's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do uh yeah so i um basically do a lot of applied research. Uh, so I founded Belongnomics about two years ago, and the, the goal is to uh, work together with uh, different stakeholders, governments, NGOs, uh, think tanks, the private sector, um, because the, the reason why I studied economics is actually not you know, to publish a ton of academic papers, uh, but rather mm -hmm. to really help uh, create positive impact. And so, and the best way to do this in my view is to say, okay, here's a problem, Let, let's bring the, the the, the, the different groups together uh, that needs that need to be uh, uh, on the table and help change uh, things and improve uh, societal outcomes. For me, it's all about creating inclusive growth, uh, helping people, you know, uh, participate in, uh, in 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 a growing economy. And um, 
So a lot of the, the projects that I do are uh, geared towards that. Yeah, fantastic. Well, hopefully with the with satellite internet and 5G eventually, like we'll have, um, there'll be no excuse for being able to access communities wherever they are. Um, so hopefully that will help someday. Listen, uh, Mateus, great. Thank you so much for today. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.